Hello, and welcome to In the Privy Council, a podcast reviewing cases heard before the Judicial Committee of His Majesty's Most Honorable Privy Council, brought to you by the Legal Style Blog. I'm your host, Elijah Granin. This week, we're discussing the Trinidadian case of Attorney General and Trin Salvage, the citation for which is 2023 UKPC 26, T and T. Before we begin, a reminder that because Trinidad and Tobago is a republic, this case is decided directly by the Judicial Committee rather than by His Majesty. This case deals with the law of unjust enrichment, specifically with the question of when a claim in unjust enrichment stultifies, meaning blocks or interferes with, the purpose of public policy and is therefore inadmissible. It is a case where none other than my lord, Lord Burroughs, sometime professor of the law of England at the University of Oxford, sometime fellow of All Souls College, who literally wrote the book, indeed many books, on this subject, gives a strong majority opinion in the case, and one where my lord, Lord Briggs of Westbourne, himself a titan of private law jurisprudence, gives an equally strong dissent. The task for you, the listener, is to determine which of these eminent jurists you think got the case right. Let's start with the facts. Trin Salvage had a contract with the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Works and Transport, acting on behalf of the government of Trinidad and Tobago, to engage in coastal reclamation. For our purposes, all that matters is that Trin Salvage then billed the ministry for additional work performed under that contract, amounting to approximately £570,000. When they did this, the ministry disputed that it had any liability to pay for that work, because the original contract was void for lack of authority. The government argued this was uh, because the Central Tenders Board Act, as amended here and after, the Act requires that any contract with some exceptions that don't matter here, on behalf of the government be submitted to the Central Tenders Board, which will then consider them independently before it can be signed. The purpose of this act is a noble one, to prevent kickbacks, corruption, and incompetent and wasteful uses of public money. Over a rather long period of years, this claim very slowly worked its way through the courts. At first instance, my lord, Mr. Justice Siprasad, found that there was a valid claim for quantum merit, that is to say the value of the work done, under the law of unjust enrichment. The government appealed to the Court of Appeal, which upheld, albeit with reasons Lord Burroughs would criticize as somewhat incoherent, uh, the claim for quantum merit. The government then appealed to the board, where we take up the case. For the board, my lord, Lord Burroughs, began by examining the voidness of the contract. The contract here was not void for illegality, but rather because of either lack of authority, or more probably because it was ultra viris, outside the bounds of the permanent secretary's power. This point will become important as we move through the unjust enrichment analysis. Lord Burroughs then considered the three elements of unjust enrichment. To review, those are, first, that the defendant has been enriched, second, that this enrichment was at the expense of the claimant, and third, that the enrichment was unjust. These three elements are sufficient for a claim unless there is an adequate defense presented, like change of position, or indeed, stultifying public policy. Counsel for the Attorney General, Mr. Thomas Rowe, K.C., whose submissions were praised by Lord Burroughs as succinct and pellucid, accepted that Trin Salvage could demonstrate all three of these elements. Thus, Lord Burroughs could move on to the question of a defense. Here, the defense was the question of stultification of public policy. To explain stultification in the context of public contracts, Lord Burroughs relied on a case called Hoegesund Commune, Uh, 2012, Queen's Bench, page 549, Court of Appeal, where my lord, Lord Justice Aikens, explained that if a restitutionary claim, quote, 
is inconsistent with the express provisions of a statute, or, I would say, its clear intention, then English law will not permit the claim as a matter of public policy. That is because a common law claim for restitution cannot be allowed to circumvent legislation whose object and effect is to bar such a recovery. So stultification, uh, which Lord Justice Aikens also called the defense of public policy, is a sister doctrine to contractual illegality, which may be familiar to listeners from cases like Patel and Mirza, 2017, Appeal Cases, page 467, Supreme Court, as well as cases where restitution applies uh, to contracts which have failed for lack of form, which Canadian listeners, for instance, may recognize from the famous case of Degelman and Guarantee Trust Company of Canada, 1954, 3 Dominion Law Reports, page 785. Because this is a defense to unjust enrichment, the burden of proof lies with the defendant, who must show that the otherwise made-out claim of unjust enrichment cannot proceed. In deciding if the restitutionary remedy stultified public policy, Lord Burroughs emphasized the doctrinal distinction between contractual and restitutionary remedies. A contractual remedy, as famously described by Mr. Baron Park in Robinson and Harmon, 1848, 1 Exchequer Cases, eight, page 850 at page 855, is to put the claimant in the same position as she would have been had the contract been performed. By contrast, a restitutionary remedy aims to undo the unjust enrichment which has occurred. This has significance in cases like the one at bar, because the remedy is very distinct. For example, if Trin Salvage got a fantastic bargain with the ministry, and was getting paid way over the market rate for its materials, a contractual remedy would require Trin Salvage be paid for the contractual, that is to say, the unfair to the ministry and great for Trin Salvage, value of those materials. A restitutionary remedy, on the other hand, starts from the point of the market value, because it is not there to meet a contractual right to a certain price, but rather to reverse the injustice caused by the enrichment. This matters because Mr. Rowe Casey had argued that the contractual claim and the restitutionary claim were identical, and therefore it would be wrong to let restitution be a loophole to get around the contractual claim failing for voidness, and thus undermine the public policy created by the Central Tender Boards Act. Now, Lord Burroughs noted that, in fact, these are distinct remedies, and one cannot substitute the other, and therefore the loophole argument doesn't work. This is the basis on which Lord Burroughs found that the restitutionary claim is distinctly trying to put the parties in their initial positions in light of the fact that they have no valid contract between them. The Act's policy goals are to stop corruption, financial impropriety, and promote transparency. The restitutionary remedy, which will give Trin Salvage the objective market value of the materials and work done, avoids following what could be a bad contract, which would be unfair to the ministry and the taxpayer, and ensures that the work and materials are not done at an inflated contractual price. Returning to that point from earlier about illegality, the fact that the contract was void for lack of authority, ultra vires, meant there was no reason to suspect an illegality defense might be brought forward, which could undermine the unjust enrichment. There was also no reason to think that this quantum merit remedy might create a perverse incentive to conduct void contracts, since these contracts are a risk and opportunity cost, because they could be voided at any time before work began, and the contractor would gain nothing and have lost time they could have spent working a job that would have actually paid them. Thus, the claim for restitution was held to be sound, and the appeal to be dismissed. However, before finishing, Lord Burroughs had a final point to dispel a theory of contract suggested by Mr. Rowe Casey's submissions. Mr. Rowe Casey's suggestion that restitution essentially worked by fulfilling an 
implied contract, called back to a decision Lord Burroughs said had blighted the law of restitution for decades, Sinclair and Broham, 1914, Appeal Cases, page 398, House of Lords. That case's holding that restitution was essentially an implied contractual matter, with, for example, the same requirements of consideration and the same restrictions of virus, was overruled implicitly in the landmark enrichment authority of Lipkin, Gorman, and Carpnali, 1991, two appeal cases, page 548, House of Lords, and explicitly in Westdeutsche Landesbank Girozentrale and Islington London Borough Council, 1996, appeal cases, page 669, House of Lords. Any suggestion of bringing it back, Lord Burroughs emphasized, was not welcome. Lord Burroughs' sweeping discussion of the law of unjust enrichment can be contrasted with my lord, Lord Briggs of Westbourne's short but compelling dissent. His lordship agreed with Lord Burroughs on the points regarding the restitutionary remedy, but disagreed on the simple point of stultification, where public policy, as expressed in an act of parliament, overrode the fairness and justice concerns of the law of unjust enrichment. For Lord Briggs of Westburn, the starting point on stultification was the Act, whose clear purpose was to ensure that an independent board was able to determine the best contractor. The selection and contract with Trin Salvage, quote, wholly undermined this scheme. The restitutionary remedy would give Trin Salvage money for additional work it performed solely because it was on site due to a contract flying completely in the face of the independent tendering process Parliament sought to enact. The purpose of an independent tendering body is designed to ensure a competitive market free of corruption or favors for government services. The executive choosing contractors, as here, removes that transparency and creates the damaging appearance of bias and discourages other firms from seeking tenders. That is the mischief at which the act is aimed, and the central procurement system is the mechanism by which this goal is enforced. Here, this key mechanism was flouted, and any restitutionary remedy was to give approval to Trent Salvage's wrongful position as a favored contract chosen without tender. Thus, Lord Briggs of Westbourne would have allowed the appeal. His lordship also noted, somewhat archly in an obiter dictum, that any contractor in Trinidad who seeks government tenders cannot be expected to be ignorant of the key law determining all government contracts, although his lordship emphasized this was merely an aside and did not determine his view on how the appeal should be disposed. Uh, turning now to our analysis of the case, we are faced with a stark choice of two decisions. Lord Burroughs, whose restitutionary knowledge is second to none, noted that there was no illegality here and that the objective, market-based nature of the restitutionary remedy prevented the contractor from claiming a favorable contract price, and thus the restitutionary claim did not stultify the public policy of the Act. Lord Briggs of Westbourne identified the absolute goal of the Act to make all tenders fair and transparent, to avoid creating the appearance or actual emergence of favoritism or kickbacks. This goal is undermined by any money going to those who receive it only by virtue of having concluded a wrongful tender. My own sympathies here lie with Lord Briggs of Westbourne. Public tenders are, in every country on earth, and in every jurisdiction, a venue for kickbacks, corruption, and other symptoms of large sums of government money going to private companies. The bold action of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago was to create a central, public, transparent body that could reassure the taxpayer that her money was being responsibly spent. The entire purchase of the statute is to prevent contracts precisely like the one with Trin Salvage, and the fact that Trin Salvage, and not any other contractor in the country, was in a position to perform the extra work is solely a result of flouting the statute. The policy goal of the legislation is, I would respectfully submit, clearly stultified. However, that's only my own view. 
What's yours? Feel free to email or tweet them in. Well, thank you very much for listening to another episode of In the Privy Council, brought to you by the Legal Style Blog. I've been your host, Elijah Granite. If you want more legal content, visit our website, legalstyle.co.uk, or follow us on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Legal Style Blog. If you have any comments, suggestions, rants, or raves, the email of the podcast is editor at legalstyle.co.uk. We also welcome any ratings or reviews on your usual podcast platforms. Until next time, goodbye, and remember, together we aspire, together we achieve!